Well, the layoff grenades, they keep exploding. And they're all leading up to next year when the layoff bomb goes off. That's why tonight's daily digit is 160,000. That's the number of jobs the big banks worldwide have cut since last year. Elections do have consequences, and businesses are finding that out firsthand. Just ask Orlando Health, the Florida-based hospital group that is cutting workers for the first time in its 100-year history. Because according to the company's CEO, and I quote, quote, health care reform mandates and changes in reimbursement structures for Medicare and Medicaid are forcing health care organizations throughout the U.S. to confront new challenges, unquote. Is there some kind of weird cruel type of irony here that hospitals are cutting health care workers because of the health care law? The CEO is talking about the $716 billion that Obama stiffs hospital out of to pay for Obamacare. Big surprise. The government shortchanges hospitals for seeing Medicare patients so the hospitals fire people to compensate for the lost revenue. And, and while all this is going on, consider the stock market has dropped 7% since September and Goldman Sachs is telling its clients to expect another 8% drop. I'm willing to bet the rise in capital gains taxes from 15 to 23.8% come January 1 might have something to do it with it. Meanwhile, gold prices spiked $18 today to $1,736 an ounce. And I'm just going to make mention of a metal you don't hear much about. Palladium is trading at $650. About 20 years ago, it was under 100 bucks an ounce. Joining me to discuss all of this are Ed Batowski, founder of Chapwood Investments, and Dr. John Parnell. He's the Belk Chair of Management at the University of North Carolina, Pembroke. Um, we were talking about sports earlier. Right. Um, I have been sort of charting business migration from the urban centers during the the Industrial Revolution, where you had a you had a mass influx of labor, mm -hmm. to progressive and local politicians running out the factories. All of a sudden, the textile mills that were in New York were in North Carolina. Now they're in China. Mm -hmm. Sports teams even pick up and move. Whenever government, whether it's state, local, or federal, right. begins to raise the cost of existing within the jurisdiction, people find a new jurisdiction. Yeah, and they're going to go to wherever it is most profitable. I mean, corporations, the CEO, they don't stand up one day and say, hey, you know what, I want to go and do what's best for this country. What they say is, I want to make as much money as I can for my shareholders, and that in turn will be good for my country. I mean, think for a moment. In Los Angeles, there is no professional football team. Think about that. One of the biggest cities in the entire I'm the country. I'm a fun guy guy when it comes to sports, so that's news to me. Okay. Well, having said that, here is one of the what, second or third largest city in the United States, and it's not profitable for them to be in business. So that's exactly to your point as to they will move to cities, move to places, just like Oklahoma City got a team from Seattle because they couldn't make money in Seattle, so they'll go to where they can make money. Same thing with businesses. Businesses will move and migrate to where they can make money. Now, Dr. Parnell, doesn't this prove that the market and business owners and economics in general do not follow democratic mandates? They don't. What happens, Andrew, is that companies pursue what's in their, their own interest. And, and the only surprise here is that it's being treated like a surprise. Because before the election, when we talked about Obamacare and, and Obamanomics in general, we knew this was going to happen. Because companies don't just sit back and take it. If they have tax increases or regulations, they make changes. If you make it difficult to do business in the U.S., they go to China, they go somewhere else. You raise taxes, you, if, you, if you punish someone for, for hiring a worker and, and keeping them at 30 hours and you say you have to pay a fine, well, guess what? The hours go below 30. All of this is highly predictable. And, and again, the only problem here, uh, the only surprise here, is that it's being treated by the media as if it was, was unexpected. You know, the funny thing is, and I'll bring this back to Dr. Parnell maybe in the next segment, that Mao and a lot of these, these um, iconic communist leaders, after they vanquished the human beings that comprise their opposition, they constantly kept the people on guard against capitalism or on right. guard against, it was always this specter of if you don't give the government all this authority, bad things are gonna happen. And that's what's happening now. We are literally watching this happen. The president is still campaigning. He is still pretending because he beat the man, Mitt Romney, but he can't make any of this work. No, because because it's not going to work. It makes absolutely no economic sense. Obamacare or any of the other policies have been in, that have been put in place. It just doesn't work. So we can sit there all day long and hope and pray 
all right? But it isn't going to happen. So we're not going to see jobs created. We are going to see layoffs. We are going to see higher costs. And then they're going to sit around and they're going to try to figure out another way to spin this and blame it, who? On Bush again, right? I mean, they're going to blame it on everybody else. But in the meanwhile, the country, or excuse me, the world is suffering because as the United States goes, goes the rest of the world. China, Japan, and Germany, second, third, and fourth largest economies will do well if the United States does well. Obviously, there's some other factors. Then the emerging markets will do well if those countries do well. It all starts with us. So Obama and his policies are holding the world economy hostage. You know, Dr. Parnell, when we look at companies laying workers off because they're unhealthy, that's one thing. But what about when companies start laying workers off that are healthy? Pepsi? Pepsi's laying people off. Energizer's laying people off. Hostess went bankrupt, and Richard Trumka said this is Bain-style capitalism. Bain is nowhere near this, but he's campaigning against Bain as if it's still before November 6th. You're right, it's still class warfare going on. And companies are looking at this. They're just looking at demand that they expect in the next uh, couple of years and, and making their decisions accordingly. I think when Obama was uh, elected for the first term, there was a sense that, well, this might last for a couple of years or four years. Maybe we can wait this thing out. What we see right now is perhaps a new normal. And a lot of companies are saying, hey, we, we're in for the long haul. Ob Obamacare is, is law of the land, like it or not. Uh, we have to kind of get in line here, work with uh, some kind of compromise. and and go forward. And what that means for companies to be profitable is to, to cozy up to, to Washington, cut deals, cut workers, and try to settle into a, a softer economy. Uh, they made this movie. It was called Atlas Shrugged. Guys, stay right there. More perfectly executed political analysis after the break. All right, I got one for the liberals. According to the Wall Street Journal, American companies are cutting back on investments at the fastest pace since the recession because of the fiscal cliff and economic uncertainty. Businesses are scared. I wonder why. They only face billions of dollars in new taxes, new regulations, having to provide every single employee with a health insurance plan under Obama, uh, Obamacare. They're hunkering down and waiting to see what happens because they have to protect their profits and, yeah, their shareholders. I'm back with Ed Batowski, founder of Chapwood Investments, and Dr. John Parnell. He's the Belk Chair of Management at the University of North Carolina, Pembroke. Dr. Parnell, let me bring this back to Mao. And I, I don't think I'm being extreme here because if you read the Little Red Book, uh, Mao talked about this specter that if, if, if he wasn't in charge, if the, com the communists should always be working, the people should always be working to prevent this, this capitalism thing from happening. But when you look at, like, let's say Cuba or uh, Venezuela, they're always talking about continuing the revolution. Well, what do you mean continuing the revolution? You won. It's over. Now you're in charge. Make things work. Yeah, well, when you win and you're over, then you're in power and you become the man. You know, the, the problem is this notion that, that we should always be suspicious, suspicious of the capitalist. The idea that the capitalist is out there just taking advantage of the, uh, of the worker, and, and Mao, Mao highlighted that con continuously. We have a society right now where I think the majority of the folks, I would say based on the election results, the majority of the people are suspicious of big business. They, they're suspicious of, of business in general, uh, of the personal property that they, uh, that they have, the decisions they make, and, and that's just a bad culture for us, and that's setting the stage for the, uh, the kinds of problems that we're having right now. You know, it's funny, when the Democrats talk about taxing the rich, mm -hmm. there's a difference between taxing wealth and income. Wealth is already earned. Income is wealth yet to be earned. So when you talk about corporate profits, they say this company had a windfall profit. That was last year. When you talk about rich companies not wanting to give all their poor little workers, you know, uh, health care, it's because that worker, if, if they have to uh, address the cost of that health care plan, then that worker's labor is no longer of value. They're not going to dip into last year's profits to pay for tomorrow's worker. That's, that's not the way a, a business works. It always has to stay competitive. It always has to look at the, the competitive environment. And it always has to have research money or and development money or at least rainy day money on hand. That's the function of profit. That's right. I mean, I've sat in many board meetings and I've seen the conversations with the chairman, the CEO, and everybody else. And the conversation isn't about many things other than how much money are we making? What are our expenses? How can we cut our expenses or increase our revenue? But it comes all the time back to what is that net number of what we're making? That is what they are judged on. If they were judged on something else, then, then, then you know, that would be a different story. But they're judged on profitability. They're judged on how much money they're making and how many people and how they're going to expand their businesses to make more money. That 
that's the game. So let's not judge them based on something else. If the game is how much money you make, then you know what? Go out there and make the most money you can possibly make, obviously legally. Well, Dr. Parnell, you know, every business has uh, employees that rank. I mean, if you're running a tire, a tire center, okay, the guys that put the tires on the car are more valuable than the guy you might dress up in a gorilla suit and parade out into the street to wave to come into the tire center. If you could pay that guy a dollar an hour, you might want to have a guy in a gorilla suit. If you've got to pay him the minimum wage plus health care, give him 40 hours and have him be in a union, you might just put a sign out front. Well, you hit the nail on the head, Andrew, because what's happening with all the regulation and Obamacare, what we're doing is we're raising the cost of hiring workers. And this is specifically for the low-skilled workers. And the irony here is that we're, we're hearing that this type of policy is supposed to be for the little guy. And, and for the low-skilled workers, these are the guys who are, are, are being hit the hardest by the current unemployment situation. But if you raise costs of hiring people, well, guess what? You know, if, if a worker is worth six bucks or eight bucks an hour, whatever you calculate, if you really have to pay ten, twelve, fourteen, fifteen dollars once you add up all the costs, you're just not going to hire the guy. And that's what's happening. These types of government regulations we have, and, and Obamacare combined with that, are, are creating a situation where companies simply just, just don't want to do the hiring. Let me wrap up with this one and point, uh, ask you this question. Okay. Um, companies trying to stay under the 50 employee mark mm -hmm. might start breaking up into smaller companies. I mean, you, right. you could imagine General Motors breaking out to its brands, then its models breaking out into to LLCs, and by the time you you know, add up the total number of people that are making a car for General Motors, you might have a hundred different companies with 49 employees. Right, and you, you say to yourself, and for what reason? I mean, we have a guy in my, in my town who owns a bunch of different restaurants, Kenny, and he has 150 employees. He told me the other day when I was eating lunch, he said, this is going to cost me $50,000 more a month says that's $600,000. The restaurant business doesn't have a lot of margins in it. So this guy said, I have to turn everybody into a part-time worker. I'm going to lose some of my best people to go somewhere else. And it's all because of Obamacare. So exactly to your point, we are going to see breakups all the time. We're going to see less people being hired, and we're seeing it right now. So guess what? As you said, elections have consequences, and this is one of them. And we're also going to see capital flight, and that's certainly not a good thing. Yes. All right, Ed Batowski, John Parnell, always good to have you here. We're right. They're wrong. From New York, I'm Andrew Wilkow. Good night.